just before we got started about some of our um, challenges right now, talking about workforce issues and how to, how to help people on the ground. Um, I don't know about you all, but I'm having crisis fatigue. There's, there's moments where it just feels like, my goodness, how are, we, how are we going to do this? We have workforce issues in the middle of COVID. Everybody is doing their best. I want to say, uh, first of all, to all the practitioners out there, to all the healthy aging uh, uh, folks out there working, I want to start off by saying thank you. Um, this has been an amazing year and a half. Amazing is not the right word. Sometimes crushing, sometimes inspiring, uh, but so much work. And I know it's exhausting. I know that people out there are both feeling the, the weight or the compassion of what's happening as we serve people and we see spikes and we struggle with workforce issues. Um, I know it's out there. And um, people that we have, speak with Shannon and Chris and myself, um, others that we are staff, we are overwhelmed with gratitude uh, for everything that is happening out there and, and just so appreciative of this work. Because when we have talk about today, my goodness, <clears throat> It's another crisis, right? I mean, in all of what's going on, we know that Wisconsin is number one in deaths among the elderly from falls. That we are spending about $800 million a year in Medicare, Medicaid, and out-of-pocket expenses on falls-related injuries and treatments and services. And that's probably undercounting it. There's a lot of spending that we don't know about. Amid all of this terrible weight that we have on us, we also know that the falls problem out there has been exacerbated over COVID. That people are not reporting falls to the level that they, they need to, that um, they're, they're afraid of having people come into their house, that without the physical activity, their, their muscles have atrophied, their balance is down, um, and that they're talking about other things right now, and they're still at risk of falls. So what we do want to do today is make sure that the, the aging and disability service community, the healthcare providers have a full understanding of how we can connect people through screening to services that are out there. We had a discussion last week with um, the CDC and some of our speakers who are here today as well about the resources that they have. Those resources are great, but the greatest resource we have the greatest resource is each other, sharing information across organizations, across communities, across healthcare providers, which is amazing to have uh, I care and Inclusa here with us today, UW Health um, two weeks ago, and um, we are here as well. We wanna make sure that everybody understands the best practices that are out there in terms of screening for falls risks, and then how we make those connections. So we're gonna begin with Allison Brochup from uh, I care and then move on to Christine Henson talking about how they do this work. And after we have that conversation, uh, I'll give Shannon Myers here with WeHa a chance to talk a little bit, and then we'll open it up for discussions. If you have questions as we're going, please put them in the chat box, but we will open this up about halfway through and have a, a pretty informal conversation about what we can do to address these pieces. So with that, um, I'm going to say thank you one more time. I feel like I should just say thank you the whole time, to everybody, and all the work you are doing. Um, I am overwhelmed with what we are under and what you guys are doing to address this, the, the multiple crises going on right now. But with that, let's hope Allison's slides work, and let's turn it over to her. Can she share her slides, and we can get started? Let's see. How's that well done. Okay. Two thumbs up. <laughs> okay, so my name's Allison Brockdrop. I work with Eye Care. Uh, as Dave said, thank you, Dave, for having me. I'm in our Family Care Partnership Program. And this program, uh, we work with members who functionally meet criteria to be in a nursing home level of care, but we work with them to connect them with services and support that allow them to stay in their home. And this home can be a variety of settings. But with this, a big part of keeping them safe in their home is assessing for false risks and then obviously educating and providing interventions. 
So to start, the very basic thing is first we need to ask about falls. Because if we don't ask, we don't know. And if we don't know, then we can't help our members. So we assess each of our members' risks for falls at regular intervals. And the first time is when they're a new member with our program. This is their initial in-person visit. And then every six months, we do a semi-annual visit where we also assess their risk for falls. At these two points in time, this falls risk assessment is done by the nurse on our team. And then in addition to these standard assessments, each of our um, interdisciplinary team members is asking a member about falls at nearly every interaction. So our members are contacted at a minimum of once a month. And during this interaction, our team is asking a member if they've had a fall. If a member reports they've had a fall, either recently or sometime in the past, then the nurse or the nurse practitioner is going to conduct this formal falls risk assessment tool. And I personally think that this is part of what makes our role at eye care so powerful and its potential for falls prevention, because few providers have this opportunity to talk with their patients quite as often as we have the opportunity to talk with our members. So we have such as great potential to really identify falls and get the ball rolling on education and prevention. And then to take this message like a little bit further and more personally, we can each talk to our loved ones about falling. And the more we do this, the more we can help normalize falls and do something about them. So as I was actually preparing for this presentation, I had just talked on the phone with my great uncle. And I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if he's had a fall before. And then I caught myself immediately thinking, oh man, well, I wouldn't want to offend him by asking him that. Mm -hmm. I caught myself reflecting on that, thinking falls should not be this taboo topic that we don't feel like we can ask somebody about because really we're just trying to keep people safe and keep them independent. So bottom line, ask. Having these conversations in any type of setting really provides the opportunity to reduce falls in our community. So now we know how often our members are assessed for falls risk, but what does that entail? Our falls risk assessment tool is based on two validated tools, one of which was covered in depth in the last webinar, which is the CDC study algorithm. And the other one is the Missouri Alliance for Home Care 10 Multifactorial Fall Risk Assessment. So using both of these tools, we developed an interactive tool that uses conditional logic. So as one person answers the questions, additional questions are prompted, depending on what that answer was. And this guides the assessor to classify if a member is low, medium, or high risk to fall. So similar to the CDC's algorithm, the key questions in this assessment start with, did you fall in the past year? How many falls have you had? Were you injured? Do you feel unsteady or stand when you're walking or standing? And do you worry about falling? If the answer to all of these questions is no, then we determine that the member is a low risk for falls and we just provide general education on falls prevention. We also like to encourage our members to always tell us if they do then have a fall later so that we can reassess at that time. If they answer yes to any of these key questions, the assessor then moves on to evaluate gait strength and balance using the tug test. And this again further helps us determine if they are low, medium or high risk for falls. If they're found to be high risk, the assessor is then asked to complete a multifactorial risk assessment. And this essentially is a checklist to help identify additional risk factors that might contribute to somebody's risk for falls. This includes many of the things that were discussed in the last webinar, such as older age, multiple diagnoses, incontinence, visual impairments, all things that have been shown in the research to increase one's risk for falling. So when our team completes this multifactorial assessment, it really serves as a guide for them to help pick what interventions would really target this member's specific risk areas for falls. So let's apply this to an example. A member of our team calls Ms. Jones for a regular monthly contact. During this phone call, we ask Ms. Jones if she's had any falls since we last talked. Ms. Jones does in fact share with us that she fell at home last week and she didn't tell anybody that I care about this yet. We asked her just to describe what happened and she explains that she had been trying to water some plants on her front porch and while she was on her tippy toes to reach the top of the plant, she lost her balance and fell to her knees. She denies any injury, she did not hit her head, she didn't lose consciousness, and she did not see her doctor for follow-up. So given this reported fall, we're now going to conduct that falls risk assessment tool. 
When we ask the key questions, her only yes is to the fall in the past year, which she just shared with us. Since we're on the phone, we cannot conduct the tug test, but we know that she has no history of balance or gait problems, but we're gonna make a note to check, check the tug test at our next in-person visit. So given the note of these questions, Ms. Jones is determined to be a low risk for falls. So now we have this great opportunity to have a conversation about falls prevention education. So every discussion with a member is an opportunity to not only assess for falls, but also provide education on falls. And I'm sure we've all heard these common myths about falls, such as falls are a normal part of aging, or thinking that reducing activity is a good way to prevent falls, or worrying that telling somebody that you've had a fall is gonna make you be less independent or make your loved ones worry more about you. Educating people about falls and falls prevention helps us debunk these myths, which is huge in promoting the importance of falls. Our falls prevention education is again based on the CDC study initiative, and we try to review the main risk factors for falls and what everyone can do to be proactive about these risks. So back to our member, Ms. Jones, we've identified her as a low risk for falls, but while we're on the topic of falls, we have the opportunity to discuss that when she goes to water her plants, she could make sure, sure that there's nothing in her way, that her walkways are clear. And this often involves making sure there's adequate lighting to make sure there's nothing hiding in her way that she might step and trip on. We could also take the time to make sure that she's got appropriate footwear when she's doing something like this. So she's not wearing loose flip-flops but has well-fitted tennis shoes. There's always more education we can give and it helps to keep it relevant to that member that we're talking with and how it's specific to their activity. Each piece of education is also a bit of an intervention. So without saying too much more as Christine's gonna follow up on interventions next, the other big things that we educate on are the importance of reviewing medications as polypharmacy can contribute to risk for falls. We also talk about going slow when changing positions to prevent dizziness or lightheadedness upon moving, which again, somebody is at more of a risk for if they're on blood pressure medications. Um, considering the use of walking aids to actually keep someone independent, which is a little counterintuitive and therefore even more important to discuss with people. Uh, talking about the importance of alarm devices that someone can use to either call for help if they're about to move and they're feeling unsteady, thereby preventing a fall, hopefully, or using it to call for help after they've had a fall so that they don't go unattended for extended amounts of times, which can lead to further complications. And the other big thing is really just promoting general health maintenance, such as vision checks. And again, just making sure they're going to their doctors so they can have those medications reviewed. All of these things are really big in preventing falls. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Christine to talk more about these specific interventions. Allison, as we hand over, I wanted to hop in and ask a question. Yeah. And we'll, we'll, we'll hop it over to Christine. So if you have somebody who's at low to moderate risk for falls, if, if they're like me, I tend to not think anything's a problem until the problem smacks me on the face, right? Um, you know, I, example is I had early cataracts and I went for a long time just say, oh, I guess that's how I see now before I said, oh my gosh, I can't drive anymore. I better get this checked. And I did. And I had cataract surgery in my late 40s. Um, so I'm probably typical of a lot of people out there. Um, how do you have that conversation? That's a terrible thing to admit as a, as a healthcare person, but it's true. How do you have that conversation when somebody Maybe they haven't had a fall, but they have a bunch of near falls, but they've had falls and they've been okay. Just a couple of bruises or uh, 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 embarrassment. How do, how do you make it feel real and something that um, they need to pay attention to if they're as stubborn and frankly, as dumb as I can be? Um, <laughs> I think trying to first and foremost, normalize it and not seem judgmental a lot of people have these predisposing factors that are just going to increase their risk for falls. And sometimes it's something they can't really do much about. Uh, for example, if they are on a blood pressure medication, that's going to make them more likely to feel dizzy when they move quickly. I mean, when you're reviewing your medications, we again have that opportunity to talk about potential side effects. We could say that's awesome. You haven't had a fall yet, but they might also tell us, I do sometimes feel dizzy when I move. So just taking that as an opportunity to just 
talk about it. It's great you haven't fallen yet. But let's just keep in mind you, that might happen down the road. So make sure you're remembering to kind of move slowly, give your body time to adjust. So it, it's, it is hard. <laughs> I imagine there's an art to it as well as, as steps to go to. But I, I don't want to stop the flow. just want to jump in that with a question. Christine, let's hand over to you and we can hear your, your piece. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Christine Henson. I'm a registered nurse and a health and wellness quarter coordinator for Inclusa. We are a Medicaid CMO, very much like eye care, and we use about the same fall assessment tool as um, Allison uses in her facility. So again, we assess people when we first meet them and they come to the program. And then every six months when we meet with them, we also do monthly telephone calls and one of the questions that we ask too. So um, people that we work with are in the home community and that can look very different to every single person that we see. Um, it could be a homeless situation. It could be a nursing home situation, uh, community-based um, residential setting, um, adult family home, their own homes, uh, a family's home. So um, wherever home is, that's where we meet them. So the first thing is, is, as Allison said, is that we need to start that discussion, right? Um, letting them know what their risk factors are when you do the, the health assessment and how can we mitigate those risks. So sometimes we start, especially if it's the initial meeting that we're having with people, is that we do a home safety eval by a occupational or physical therapist that would come in. Um, they're the best discipline to know this because this is what they do all day long, right? They have wonderful suggestions like lowering the coffee cups, getting the throw rugs out, putting um, chairs and sofas up on blocks so that you're not trying to stand up from a lower sitting position. All those wonderful techniques are things that they're very good at and, and safety evals. And so we do implement that, especially if somebody's had a major change in their condition. Um, they left the house and then had complications, ended up with an amputation. They're coming back in their home um, minus the leg that they've been used to using. So um, especially if there's a change like that, a stroke or something, having somebody come back in their own environment and looking at it in a new perspective of how can we keep this safe. So we do count on um, um, home PT and OTs to make those recommendations. Usually when they make recommendations, they're looking to us to help purchase and implement some of those durable medical equipment needs. Grab bars in the bathroom, um, U-bars on beds, U-bars on tubs to help support them getting in and out safely up to a sitting position and then up on their legs. Um, Allison talked a little bit about what we call PERS, a personal emergency response system. This is kind of like what you all think about um, when we had the commercials back in the 70s on um, fallen and I can't get up. So there's many different types of PERS out there that we can offer people in the home. There's PERS that hook up to landlines. There's PERS that hook up to cell phones. There's PERS that have um, fall detection in it. So if somebody does fall, it notifies um, their next emergency person or emergency services. There are, are PERS units that can go with them out in the community um, so that if they're somebody who's very active and involved in the community, but um, you know at risk for falling, tripping, um, that that can be detected out there. Um, so there's lots of different technology out there to help keep people um, safer in their homes. Um, medication reconciliation, um, Allison mentioned this too. It's really super important, not what medications you're taking necessarily, but how are you taking those medications? Um, we had a lady uh, a couple of months ago that was having a lot of falls in the evening because she was getting up multiple, multiple times to go to the bathroom. And so when I looked at her medications and had her talk me through the medications, she was taking her Lasix, which was called fluoromazamide on her bubble pack. She was taking that in the evening because she confused it with fluoroxetine, which is her antidepressant, and she wanted to take that at bedtime in case it made her sleepy. So she was essentially taking her water pill right before she went to bed and then getting up to the bathroom all night long. So for her, it was just a matter of timing of that medication, moving it to the morning so that she was more awake and alert and able to get to that bathroom, 
and being able to have a good night's sleep and not getting up so often. Um, timing of medications of diabetes medications. So many people just take their morning pills and then they go back to sleep or they're not hungry. Um, maybe they don't eat until their meals on wheels come at noon. And for a lot of people, they may have a diabetic medication in the morning. So they're taking that medication without eating and then they're having a low or hypoglycemic episode before they can eat, which makes them very shaky and weak and passing out and, and at risk for falls. So kind of looking at the timing of medications um, with people too. Um, home safety adaptions, um, door alarms, fall detections. Um, we can put um, chair alarms, bed alarms on um, that alert other people in the home if somebody is getting up and maybe unsteady and, and so that you know that you can run to them a little faster and know that they're on the move. Um, door alarms are very good for those people with dementia that maybe have an elopement or just want to go out for a walk and not aware that they maybe need help when they're out in the community. So it alerts the loved ones and caregivers in the home that they have opened that door and they're on their way out and they could be at risk for a um, fall then. Um, we look at what kind of help can we bring to you in the home um, and additional supportive home care. Um, this could be something as easy as light housekeeping, keeping floors from getting sticky, uncluttering so there's no tripping falls, bringing in groceries um, that really is an unbalancing type of um, activities of da daily living. Um, And so maybe it's help bringing those groceries in and putting them away. That's that's going to reduce their fall risk. Um, sometimes it's a standby shower assist. Normally when I ask people, would you like some help showering? And they're like, oh, no, no, I can do that on my own. And I'm like, how about if you shower while somebody's here washing your dishes? Then they're a little bit more receptive to that. That at least they know there's somebody in the apartment or somebody in the home while I'm in that shower. And if I'm having a weakness or feeling like I'm falling, somebody can help me. So um, that's one of the um, services we can put in home to help people stay in their home safety. Service animals, um, not to be confused with emotional support animals, but there are some service animals that can be trained to help people um, navigate over um, uneven surfaces, stepping off of curbs, um, and helping reducing those fall risks too. Um, so that's kind of important too, if, it, if they um, are assessed as somebody that could really benefit from a service animal to increase their independence and decrease falls in the home, that's something that um, can certainly be explored. Nutrition is a big, huge thing. Oh, sorry. Gosh darn it. <laughs> Can you still see that, Dave? Can see your slides. Okay, thanks. Um, so um, nutrition is super, super important. And I think it's something that's overlooked, especially in the elderly. Um, losing of the muscle mass, um, not getting those vitamins and minerals that help support our bone health and muscle formation. Um, so doing a really good nutritional assessment eating is such a social behavior. And so for, for so many of our people, they've, you know, they eat alone or with COVID, they're not going to meal sites anymore. They're not going down to the community room to have, you know, birthday celebrations and, um, or, or, or luncheons and stuff. So they're eating alone. It affects their appetite. Um, so we always want to do a good nutritional supplement. Um, if it's a matter of that, it's really a big fall risk for them to even do their own cooking. Like if you're hanging on to a walker, how are you opening the oven door, right? Because you gotta take your hand off that walker to open the oven door, putting you at risk for fall. So sometimes it's just like, if you physically aren't able to do that um, type of activity anymore, can you put mobile meals in place? Um, sometimes people just have little to no appetite as they age or could be some of the medications that they're on or maybe they just got um, over a big surgery and they need to heal or they have wounds that need to heal. So looking at types of nutritional supplements to the ensures, the boosts, um, and trying to get that added benefit to help keep them strong. 
We always encourage the wellness exams. That's something Medicare and Medicaid pays for once a year. Um, so that if there are things that are physically causing issues, lab work um, that can be picked up upon um, so that um, that can help prevent falls too. Um, yearly eye exams, vision's a big thing. If you can't see those cracks in the sidewalk or you can't see um, what you're tripping on, that's um, gonna put you more at risk too. Um, and then encouraging the range of motion exercise and strengthening programs. And I'm not gonna to talk too much about that because Shannon's gonna share some information with that when I'm done speaking. Um, but this doesn't have to be a YMCA, right? I carry a dollar TheraBand in my nursing bag. Like, can you use a TheraBand? Can you tie it to the side of the recliner that you live in and just do like arm punches every time a commercial comes in just to keep your tone up? You're never too old to have body tone. And that's one of the things that help prevent us from falling is, is having that skeletal support um, and that tone um, and endurance to be able to do the activities that we want. Um, so range of motion pro uh, programs, is there a tape you could put in to do? Um, are there cans of soup that you can lift once a day just to keep your arms uh, moving and, and keep that strength up? Um, so Shannon's gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, when I'm done. And then um, one of the big things, and I know Allison touched on this too, is having that empathetic approach, right? Acknowledging that change is hard, but possible. Yes, I know that you, you know, really like to go down in the basement to do your own laundry. And that's very important you to keep that independence. But it's a huge tripping and falling hazard for you, especially some of these older homes in Wisconsin where it's a cement landing. Um, you know, so kind of problem solving, like, yes, you want to do your own laundry. If we had somebody take it down and bring it up and you folded it and you put it away, would that be a good compromise? We never want to tell anybody they can't do some, something. We want to be able to encourage them. How can we do it in a safer way? Right. Um, and I'll use the instance of my mother <laughs> because I know she wasn't able to log on and she can't hear me. So my mom loves birds. She lives out in the country. She lives in an older home. It's a home they've been in for over 50 years and birds are a thing. And in the winter, she likes to feed her birds. And so we've had a couple of, of incidences where dad's plowed <laughs> a path to the bird feeder. And during the night, the snow has melted and froze and it's gotten slippery and mom has fallen down because she's got seed in her arm and usually the dog and and she's gone down a couple of times and so we don't want to say no you can't feed your birds mom but how can we do that in a safer manner so we got her some of those cleats from walmart under ten dollars she puts those on her on her boots they help her grip when in the ice my dad was um, wonderful enough to bring the bird feeders closer to the home so she's not going out as far to um to feed those um, birds. My brother did a pulley system so that the bird feeders can be lowered down. She can, she can fill them from a, a waist level and she's not reaching up over her head, causing her to lose balance and go backwards. And so she's able to keep her love of the birds alive. It's her passion. And we're able to do it in a safer manner and not worrying about her you know, falling out on the ice and, and really hurting herself. Um, so you know, really working on on what are their strengths? What are their resources already in place? Who's there um, to help them already? And what does that help look like? Um, and especially in this time of, of, of the COVID pandemic where we have a caregiver shortage, really building on those natural strengths and resources has been really important today because I can't promise you all get supportive home care in there to um, sweep your floor today, right? It might be a waiting list. It might be a few weeks before we can get somebody staffed in there, but who can we call in to help you with this until we can get an agency in? Is there a neighbor? Is there somebody from church? Is there a retired senior um, program that would come and do that? Um, you know, just kind of um, problem solving some of that. I know one of the recommendations when we looked at um, equipment, somebody threw out there, can we fund those rombo, rombo, I, I don't have one, but those automatic um, sweepers and vacuum cleaners that just go around the house. 
Yes, thank you. You know, can we fund one of those until we can get somebody in to physically clean the, clean the floors? So just kind of looking outside the box, like what are our resources? How can we help that person? Incorporating those supports um, and establishing what's important to the person um, and making sure that that conversation is person-centered. Like I can come in there on my soapbox and say, you need to do this, this, and this, you know, or you're gonna fall, right? Um, but what's important to them? Oh, this is really important that I have this rug by my chair <laughs> um, because my mother made this rug and I'm seeing it as a tripping hazard. She's seeing it as a memento. So how can we put that rug over the back of the sofa so you can still see it, but it's not necessarily under your feet. So um, making what's important to them is really important um, in, in, in your approach and being empathetic and really avoiding those trigger words. I just cringe when I go out to meet people and family and God bless them, they're, they mean well. The first thing they say is, if you fall again, we're gonna put you in a nursing home. And that just frightens people beyond belief because it's really nobody's goal in life to end up in a nursing home. It really isn't. Um, so then they're not as forthcoming and they're not honest with us when they are having struggles because, oh my gosh, you're gonna tell my daughter mm -hmm. and I'm gonna end up in that nursing home. So my first response to family is people can fall in the nursing home just as much as they can fall in home. It's true, right? People that are impulsive, you can have 24 seven staff. If you're gonna get up out of that chair and slip and fall, you're gonna do it in a nursing home just like you do it in a home. So reassuring the people that we're not headed to the nursing home that we can make this work at home is, is really important. But you know, trying to avoid those words, even how you're wording the word fall, right? So sometimes we say, have you had any near misses? Are there any times that you've lowered yourself to the ground? People with neuromuscular disorders like MS, MD, they'll um, refer to it as um, I went to my knees, right? Their legs give out, the, the, uh, their, their motor abilities um, aren't necessarily there the weekend. And so a lot of times they just lower themselves to the knees and they don't necessarily call it a fall, um, but it's it's potentially could make a, a, a bigger fall for them. So sometimes it's just wording tone. Um, sometimes you'll find somebody who's like, nope, I'm fine, I'm fine. But you're sitting there looking at them and they look like a, a pear. They're just bruised everywhere. Like, where did you get that from? Oh, you know, I, I slipped in the driveway and I, and I fell up against the car. Well, that really wasn't a fall. He was answering me honestly, but it was a, it was a potential circumstance that we could change. Like, could we get somebody out to Salton and and um, shovel your driveway for you this winter, so that that there's not that um, risk there that we've mitigated that. So sometimes that's the 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 wonderful part of my job is that I'm there where you're at, right? I'm not in an office talking to you on the phone. I'm in your home and I'm seeing everything that's in your home and your animals and your pets and your and your clutter and, and, and things that are putting you at risk. And so how can we have that conversation with organizing a little bit or putting night lights out at night? Or can I get you a, a sometimes it's simple as we have volunteers that sew us bags that we put on walkers so that they can keep their bottle of water and their remote control and their cell phone with them at all times. You know, simple fix. It's there so that if you are feeling weak or you are, and are unfortunately you did fall, you can at least call for help. Um, so sometimes it's just kind of adding those little things that they probably don't realize <laughs> is going to decrease their fall, but you know in your head from evidence-based practice that it will. Um, so those are um, just some of the things that we do when we go out to see people um, and help keep them safe in their home. So Christine, I'm, I am uh, appreciative and impressed with the individualized person-centered approach you're able to take and, and heard that from Allison as well. You know, this ability to say, you know, where are you and, and, and really have this conversation and even be in their homes. What would, this is a question for both you, Christine and Allison. Let's say you're a, a healthcare provider on this call, but um, this isn't your focus. You are doing intake and you have very little time, right? So um, you have people coming in and um, perhaps the doctor will be in in a little bit and you don't have much time, but you want to make sure that you have a falls conversation and then see if you need to do more. What would, what would you do if 
this is again for you, Allison, as well. What would you say to somebody like that who knows falls are important, but has very little time with that individual patient? And I really am impressed, I'll say again, with Inclusa and Eye Care that they're getting this person centered approach, but to somebody who doesn't have uh, um, all of that, they've got to get through this quickly. What should they do? Allison, you're a provider, so I'll let you answer. <laughs> well, I'll add that I'm a relatively new grad provider, so I have yet to work in the hustle and bustle of a clinic as a provider. But um, I think, like I kind of said earlier, the big thing is just asking, have you had a fall? And trying to learn what you can in the time that you have, and then knowing, hopefully knowing what resources you can get them in touch with. So if, if I weren't the provider and I was the medical assistant or the nurse doing the intake, I'm pretty sure it's usually standard pra practice to ask if they've had a fall, but making sure if I don't have the time to have that discussion, I pass it on to the provider when I let them know the patient's ready. By the way, they had a fall recently. You might want to ask them more about that. Just kind of making sure, okay, we've gathered this information once you've asked. What, what do we want to do about this? Who in the community could we maybe get them in touch with? If I'm in a clinic and I don't know the local resources, you can ask your front desk staff. Usually they're a little bit more in touch with things in the community. Um, just asking, asking the patient, asking the people you work with is I think probably gonna be the best step. I think you know, so that's a great answer. You know, asking the question, maybe have a couple different ways that you ask it. You know, have you fallen? Have you had a near fall? Do you sound as steady? The kind of questions that you had right there are a quick way to do it. And then it's about connecting them, right? Because maybe you have this backlog of patients that you have to get to, and you need to then say, what can I do to connect that person to the services they need? All the research I've seen out there says that the um, number one place that people pay attention to for referrals is from their healthcare provider, right? That, uh, uh, um, that if they can get, especially on an electronic uh, uh, piece to come forward and say, Hey, connect to this program or how that works uh, in their piece to connect to the community-based programs that are out there. They can spend this time with them. And with that, I want to turn over to our own Shannon Myers, our Director of Program Implementation here at um, WEHA, to talk a little bit about that connection point and the resources that are out there. Shannon, so somebody has and is, is, is a bit at risk for falls. It could be moderate, you know, that they're at risk for falls. And we want to get them into a program in their community. Talk about what we do next for that person. Yeah, well, I'm going to just take a step back here and Please. just kind of highlight some of the programs that we do have. And then I will definitely share how we can get those individuals connected. Um, we have, uh, I know, I see a lot of familiar faces and names on the call today. So it's wonderful to see that. But it's also great to see new ones. And um, it's always nice to share about what programs we do have available underneath our umbrella that we provide support to. Um, either uh, they are a, or they are a direct program that we are a national license holder for, or we obtain a license for a statewide implementation of the program. But the individual. Uh, the programs I'm going to talk through today is that we hold that national license holder um, position for. And the first one I wanted to share a little bit about is physical activity for lifelong success. Some of you might very well know it as PALS. And this uh, is an evidence-based program really to design to help older adults who are sedentary become more active. Um, the, the program itself meets about three times a week for 10 weeks. And then uh, there's follow-up coaching sessions, either in, um, in person or can be done by calling as well to facilitate that behavior change. Cause we know that it takes about three months for an individual to make changes. And what this program does is there's, a, an exercise circuit that helps, uh, individuals to move through a program that can be uh, a beginner level level, and then work themselves up to, uh, an advancing stage, whatever that person needs to be at and to continue to grow. But they give them the general concept of exercising and balance um, through that process or through that circuit that happens um, about, it's about an hour of time. And then once a week they meet for an additional 30 minutes to talk, 
highlight and talk about different other well-being topics. So Christine, you had mentioned a lot about nutrition and how important that is for older adults. And, and that is very much one of um, those topic areas during those 10 weeks. So uh, that is one of our programs. The next one is, as uh, Dave had mentioned, that you know, with the uh, pandemic, that we are sitting a little bit more, or individuals might be sitting out, uh, sitting down, and not moving as much. And so we have what program that's called Stand Up and Move More, and this is also an evidence-based program designed to help older adults reduce sitting time by standing up and moving more. Uh, so we work with them to provide um, or strategize ideas of how they can. Um, incorporate more activity and, and making sure that they're not sitting for longer periods of time, but, but lessening that. And so this program meets once a week for two hours for four weeks, and then it's followed up by a booster session about uh, two months after. And this is, um, both of these programs are facilitated by one person. And then our next one here is uh, a women's incontinence program. It's called Mind Over Matter, Healthy Bowels, Healthy Bladder. And this program helps women to build skills and confidence that they need to avoid or improve symptoms um, of incontinence that deal with both bladder and bowel leakage. Uh, this program does meet three times every other week for two hours. And, um, and then there's an optional booster session uh, to follow up on if they want. This one is also facilitated by one um, trained facilitator from the community. And then uh, more getting into what Dave had asked is a little bit about our kind of coined program in this area for fall prevention is stepping on. Uh, I know that a lot of you are familiar with the program, but for those of you that aren't as familiar, it is a seven week multifactorial program. So we incorporate balance and strengthening exercises during these sessions, but we also have different topics that relate to falls, such as safe footwear, um, identifying home hazards and problem solving on how we can eliminate or decrease those hazards. We talk about um, uh, medication management, how to talk with your healthcare a facilitator. So a lot of what we've already heard about today. So it's just uh, another great opportunity for members in the community, um, individual or uh, independently living individuals that can come to the program and and this program kind of takes it one step further in terms of having the individual come up with ideas of what's realistic for them. And then um, the facilitators acting as a support to make sure that you know what they're working towards is safe, um, but then also have them report back on how it went and to incorporate their peers. So we want to um, make sure that we understand that yes, falls are very common. However, they are not normal part of aging. and and by bringing that small group together, they understand that, okay, my fall was unique to me or my fear of falling is unique to me, but everybody else around the table here has something related to falls that they want to address. And so that's um, what this program does. And uh, this is usually led by two facilitators or a facilitator and a peer leader. And um, we are also working on packaging a Spanish version of the program, and that one is called Pisando Forte. Um, I think it means actually strong stepping. And so um, there's a few different tweaks that relate to that adaptation. So once that becomes finalized, we'll, we'll share more about that program as it comes forward. But um, really beyond these programs is, I wanna make sure that you still connect with your local ADRCs and public health departments because they also have either like a lending closet or um, items that they can get connected with if, if they're not wanting to join a program. However, if they're wanting to join a program, I'm gonna have Chris pull up the WeHa website for me, please. I'll let her get that going. Um, if we want to get them connected to the program, uh, if you're not familiar with our website in the upper right hand corner, you'll see uh, find a workshop feature. So when we click on that, you can click on the program as well as a given um, uh, county in which that person may live. And so we want the person that is actually registering to call and register with that coordinator. So um, yeah, Chris, if you wanna just pull up and see. So if we look at that first one, sorry. <laughs> if 
we look at that first one here, you know, um, we've got Sheboygan County. It gives all the information on what time, where, when is this in person, virtual, and how do I get connected to this uh, workshop? How do I get registered for this workshop? Okay. So if that's not an option, um, we do have a lot of program providers that are um, throughout the state that we can get you connected with. And uh, if they don't have stepping on, we can talk about maybe bringing it to their area. What, what are some of the barriers as to why maybe they don't have it currently? Um, but we also can talk to uh, pro potential future program providers to become new providers of the program in, in communities and help bring that program to your area by letting you know about the, the training opportunities and what it all includes. Um, so if that does, if the program itself does not exist, we definitely want to have a conversation or strategize how we might help bring that program to that local community. Uh, I see a question in the chat here. Um, so most of the programs that WEHA offers are, um, has the two options, either to be delivered in person or virtual. Uh, right now, PALS, or the Physical Activity for Lifelong Success, is only in person at this time. Um, so uh, then, uh, I don't know if we can find a workshop, Chris, that has one that's showing. Yeah, Shannon, I just, um, I just pulled up the, the, the landing page for find a workshop. And here's where um, we will post um, workshops that are online anywhere in the state. So you can click this link here and find mm -hmm. that. Um, I'll see what we have up currently. Um, we try to keep this updated, but this is a way to find um, any of our program workshops that might be happening virtually um, and it, you know, not, no longer dependent on being in a program in the community where you live. You can take the workshop virtually. Well, it, I would just want to say in most cases, um, in there most are some, cases, yeah, True. <laughs> there are some communities that, um, it, you know, for example, if uh, the program is being held by Dane County facilitators, that program provider might have restricted funding that they can only allow that funding to support residents attending that program in Dane County. Mm -hmm. So there's, there might be some of those restrictions, but we do make sure we capture that information. So then that way, um, that even at WEHA, we know if uh, there's a class that is county specific, region specific, or if it's open up to the entire state. Um, right. And, and the things that uh, you'll see on this list are open to all residents. So mm -hmm. we, these are the ones that we've vetted to make sure that are available to anybody, any place in the state. Yeah. And then, uh, Chris, if you go back to the find a workshop page, You'll, it'll even identify um, the program if it's online and in person, and also if it's only pertaining to one county or multiple counties as well. I don't know if we have any of those coming up. Let's Maybe. see. I, I, I would have had to like check and find, try to find them. So uh, in advance, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't nope, start okay. them that's, out. That's but here, here we, here's some stand up workshops. <laughs> And this will tell you, this one is online, for example, the one that started October 26th, yeah. which is today, uh, yeah. is, taking, is taking place online. Yeah, and Versus. only in Brown County, and then if you look more down, it says all multiple counties and tribes. This is, this is terrific. Yeah, so thank you, Shan. What we have done today is um, we have people coming at this from, from all places, people who are practitioners within a health plan, people who are working within their ADRC, people working for other community organizations. And our hope is that we now have an understanding of, and some of you already had this, but for many of us, an understanding of what's happening in the clinical conversation, the outpatient conversation, and then the connection to the programs that are out there. Um, I, I was, I, I've been at WEHA for, for less than a year and have been really excited about these programs, but also just really appreciative of what's happening at the community level as we try to recover from COVID and putting these, these pieces out there. I'd like to open up to discussion. Keep some questions we might have out there, knowing that we are in this struggling to emerge from a pandemic, providing services, and that we're aware of within the over, overall crisis of COVID, we have the crisis of being the, the leading state uh, in terms of deadly falls here. And we have at the same time, 
incredible practitioners, incredible resources, and programs like Stepping On, which come from Wisconsin here, right? This is from, this is, this is, our, this is our program. Uh, so we have the resources to address it. But I wanna open up to questions from the group, things that you may have about how you screen, how you make referrals. Um, I wanna also say that we're looking always for more providers and more facilitators. So if you would like to think about how you, through your organization, start with some of these trainings, that's our job too, to help you. Let me back up now. What questions do we have from folks? We're from maybe from the um, the, the, the discussions as well. Dave, could I could I interject one quick thing since Absolutely. I still have the screen up? Um, I just want to also point out that you 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 know as Shannon walked you through the find a workshop and and you can see what workshops are currently happening. We also have a referral space here that I'm just going to click on. If you're um, if you're wanting to refer uh, somebody to one of our programs, and, and this also includes um, some of the diabetes education and support programs, we have two links here where you can um, click the link, um, select the program, tell us a little bit about yourself and the person that you're referring, and then we will get to work trying to find um, a workshop that matches um, the needs uh, of the person who's um, looking for some support. So um, I just wanted to quick call your attention to that as well. Um, it gives you an option, another opportunity if you're not finding a program that's currently existing that you can also send us a referral and we'll work to help um, make that happen. All right, thank you, Chris. Let's open up the questions. The first question is always the hardest. Um, so here, let's, let's look at our online. We have from Heather James. I recently started working with doctors of physical therapy in Jefferson County, and they've offered to pair up. While I do cognitive screenings, they can offer false risk assessment, a collaborative opportunity. I'd say that you know, this is also one of the solutions that we're seeing out there at the community level. Um, you know, the ADRCs are out there with a little bit of money to run these programs, but they're also working with other people in other groups in their counties. Uh, they're working across counties to say, uh, what could we do to pull our resources and run some of these programs together? Shannon, do you wanna um, say anything about some of the innovative collaborations that are happening out there in Wisconsin? Uh, there, there's a lot of great examples out there, models. Um, it, it just really depends on the, the county and the community of what's available uh, for those levels of partnerships. But um, in some areas, we have some very robust partnerships going on where there's kind of a, a central person, a coordinator that just partners with local public health departments, um, YMCAs, uh, healthcare facilities to help bring programs throughout the community. And then we, in other areas, um, there might only be one coordinator of the program. However, they work with different facilitators across the county from UW Extension, public health and so forth to get them engaged with programs um, as well. So a uh, couple of different models, but um, I know, uh, for example, like step, stepping on, I believe is in 56 or 57 counties and uh, two, two or three tribes, I believe. Um, so we know that there's better collaboration that can happen where we can get that reach out and into the hands of those community members. But um, we work with those program providers to help strengthen partnerships within the community if that's needed, if that's not already established. Because in, in this case, we know that many have hands make light work. And so the more opportunity we can help provide that uh, with partners across the state, you know, the, the better it's not only benefiting those organizations, but it's the community members that they're serving. Thanks, Shannon. Any other questions out there from our, our participants or speakers? Let's think about this a little bit here. Any, anything anybody else wanna jump in here? One of the things I was hoping you could talk a little bit, Shannon, about is, you know, we're talking about linking um, the, the, the clinical piece to the community piece, but there are other places out there that we need to be connected to. And I know you think a lot about emergency services, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, I wanted to put out there that um, anecdotally, we have heard that 40% of visits that EMS services are doing in communities is false related. And it's easily the number one uh, uh, call that you're getting. It's false. 
So uh, talk a little bit about some of the pieces that are happening out there. There's also, I know, an innovative collaboration out there in Brown, Brown County. Yeah, yeah. So there, there's a lot of different levels of collaboration between um, primarily where we're seeing it right now is uh, through ADRC's Aging and Disability Resource Centers or aging units, um, working with their local EMS or emergency services departments. And um, they, some of them are, are incorporating different programs where if the EMS goes out and does a lift assist or um, where someone has fallen, but they're not being transported to uh, a healthcare facility, but ideally is they're just gathering some light information, HIPAA compliant, of course, and sharing it back to the, the coordinator, the ADRC, to um, make some initial conversations with that individual to get them connected to the resources. And one of those might very well be a fall prevention program that they have um, within their scope of resources to offer. So they, they get them lined up with a program that's coming up or, um, or if they have to be put on a waiting list, kind of strategize about some of the steps of what they can do in that time. And with that is there's some Partnerships, uh, Dave had mentioned Brown County where um, uh, Barb Michaels, I don't know if she's on today, I didn't see your name initially, but she might have popped on already, uh, but she is working with her coalition um, with an emergency doctor and EMS to help bring uh, awareness around falls prevention and to help process those uh, lift assists appropriately so then that way they don't become frequent flyers. and. Um, that's often what they see is frequent flyers. If they're not visiting them once, they're visiting them twice <laughs> and within a week. And you know, you think about those resources and how they can be better placed in the community um, versus going to the same house on a regular basis. And so um, that that's what we're looking at. And we're we're going to be looking for those programs throughout the state and learning more about those processes and seeing how we can further that that in all communities or majority of the communities and really have it be effective. Thank you so much, Shannon. I, I wanna thank uh, Alice and Christine, Shannon, all of you, and let you all guys also know some of the things that are happening here at WEHA about this. Um, we're trying to pull together individual practitioners, community-based providers, uh, EMS to hospitals, to adult protective services, get everybody working on falls. And so sharing this information is important. One of the things that we'll be doing in the future, though, is really investing in this statewide. Currently, there's an appropriations bill with Senator Baldwin that would provide the, uh, for the funding of a Wisconsin Center for Falls Prevention, which would engage in a statewide public education campaign and really look at the best practices across the state and replicate them. One of the things that I would love to hear from you, everybody on this call, is it more about the challenges that you're facing? Uh, is it workforce issues? Is it um, about getting enough participants? Because we know people are, are hesitant to join these programs. Um, we will have many calls in the future, many conversations between our providers, between our older adults and their caregivers and our health plans about how, and Department of Health Services, all of us, about how we work on this as a greater scale. Um, so this is the beginning of a conversation. This is just the very beginning. We have heard from the Centers for Disease Prevention and Control. We have heard from Wisconsin, uh, UW Health. We have heard now from iCare and from Inclusa, and you've heard from WEHA. Those are the first two calls. The next call we're going to put together is going to be purely collaborative. And it's going to be us thinking about these issues that are out there and having a discussion about what do we need to do at the state level? Yes, we need to expand. We need to expand stepping on and the other programs. We need to make sure that practitioners are asking the questions, providing the screenings and connecting to the services and doing the empathetic person-centered approach that we've heard from iCare and Inclusive today. But what are the other areas of investment? What do we need to be doing for diverse communities, uh, for low-income staff? What do we need to be doing in places where uh, it's a long drive and there's no broadband? Um, there are, we need uh, um, the individual clinical interventions that you've heard discussed today, and we need systems change. So I'm hoping that folks in this call can join us. We are, we have not scheduled it yet, because we want to get together and listen to what we've heard. And the next conversation we will have will be about 
how we go beyond what each of us can do as individuals, but to, to what we can do as a statewide community and how we could really ratchet up the resources, the investment and the solutions that are out there, tackle this as crisis within a crisis that we're dealing with. So that's what I wanna end it with. I hear we're at one o'clock and I wanna respect anybody's time, but think about those questions. What would it take to make Wisconsin number 50 in deaths from elderly falls? That's our goal, right? Let's be, you know, let's be number one in, in football and basketball and, and uh, something else. But let's let this one go. Think, so as, as, you're, as you're having your, your coffee tomorrow morning, um, as you're thinking about your work today, think about what you would recommend. What challenges are you having as providers? What are your stressors? And how do we support each other with the same empathy we heard Christine and, and Allison talking about giving to their community members and their health care their health care plans. That's what we have for you today. Uh, so one more conversation for this year and a lot more to come. Thanks everybody.